You are listening to Meet the Thriller Author, the podcast where I interview writers of mysteries, thrillers, and suspense books. I am your host, Alan Peterson, and this is episode number 46. In this episode, you're going to be meeting William Bernhardt, who is an award-winning and best-selling author of more than 40 books, including the blockbuster Bank and Kate Legal Thrillers, the historical novel Nemesis, The Final Case of Elliot Ness, which is currently being adapted into a miniseries. He's also written a book of poetry and a series of books on fiction writing. In addition, Bernhardt founded the Red Sneaker Writing Center in 2005, hosting writing workshops and small group seminars, and becoming one of the most in-demand writing instructors in the nation. His monthly e-blast, the Red Sneaker Writers Newsletter, reaches over 20,000 people, myself included. And he uh, has a course coming up in uh, May uh, called Writing the Thriller Novel, and that's going to run from May 18th to June 29th of 2017. It's an online course offered via the Writer's Digest University. I recommend you go check that out if you're interested. You can learn more about that course and enroll by visiting thrillingreads.com forward slash course. All right, let's get to meet William Bernhardt. William, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Oh, I'm doing fantastic. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on the uh, podcast. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Glad to be here. All right. So can you tell us a, a little bit about yourself, about your background? Well, I'm from Oklahoma. I grew up there and went to school there. Uh, But all I ever wanted to do was write. All I ever (laughs) wanted to be was a writer. If you believe my mom, and, you know, we got to because she's my mom, I was telling people I was going to be a writer when I was seven. I'm not sure anybody really believed it, but that's (laughs) what I was saying. And I wrote and sent things off. I got my first rejection letter when I was 11 which I've still got, along with several hundred others, but kept plugging away at it. And as you said, finally, it worked out for me. And so how would you describe your books to someone who isn't, uh, isn't familiar with them? Well, I've been pretty diverse, particularly in the last few years. I think, uh, of course, what I'm best known for is the thrillers, and particularly the series of courtroom thrillers I did with the character Ben Kincaid which started in 1991 with Primary Justice, and there have been 17 more since. And uh, I, took, I took a break from the series for a while because I wanted to do some other things, but I've done another one now that I'm hoping will come out later this year. Is that a new series, or is that the Ben Kincaid Returns? Yeah, yeah, that's Ben Kincaid Return. That's ju- Justice Returns. I think <laughs> several books in this series all had the word justice in it. Uh, so uh, some people still associate that with Ben Kincaid, who was, of course, a Oklahoma attorney, as I was once upon a time, but seemed to get in all kinds of trouble and all kinds of mysterious uh, and murderous situations. Uh, but that that was that was, was a fun series, and of course, way more successful than I ever expected. Uh, so that's not the only thing I've written, obviously, since I've got over forty books. But th- that's probably the best known. Do you find like you say you were he was like a, a, a Oklahoma attorney like you were? Do you find the, your personality uh, in Ben Kincaid or any of your characters? You know, I can see a little bit of myself in all of my characters. Even the really nasty ones, but <laughs> I don't know how you can uh, create a character unless you can relate to them a little bit, which doesn't mean they're literally based on you. I haven't solved any mysteries recently. I wish I had, but uh, you know, it, it doesn't come up so much in everyday life. Uh, but but I think there's always a little bit of a connection. Maybe you exaggerate uh, certain features. But there's some uh, grain of reality to it. Uh, Like I was saying, even in the bad guys. uh, And and I think that's useful because it helps, it prevents you from creating characters that are just caricatures or stereotypes. Uh, To me, the most boring bad guys are the ones who just turn out to be crazy (laughs) or, you know, greedy or suddenly at the end. Uh, But if, on the other hand, is it, author, you ask yourself, what would ever motiva- motivate me to do something like that? What could ever cause me to pull a trigger on someone? And then you start coming up with a more realistic, uh, more motivated characters. 
and, and w- which I think makes the, the fiction much more realistic. And when you started to write the th- uh, thrillers, uh, was that were you a fan of that genre as a reader before you started to uh, try to write a book in that in that genre? Well, I loved mysteries. I started reading mysteries when I was in college. Uh, in junior, uh, you know, earlier than that, I was really more of a science fiction person. But when I started trying to think about what I would write, I turned to mysteries. Really, my thought process, uh, first I tried to write, uh, you know, my deep literary stuff, which nobody was remotely interested in. I published some since, but not way back then. I didn't think I had the science background to write science fiction. I certainly was underqualified to write romance, so that left crime novels. And I had read a lot of those Golden Age mysteries, uh, Agatha Christie, Ellery Queen, that sort of thing. Not really thrillers, but mysteries. And so then I started thinking, well, maybe I can mix that with my background as a trial attorney and come up with something there. And of course, as you know, at some point after I started writing these in the 90s, uh, people started talking about legal thrillers, uh, you know, John Grisham and Scott Churro and other people like that. And uh, legal thriller became a thing that, uh, that I, I never really anticipated. So, of course, then I started adding more thriller elements and it turned out pretty well for me. Yeah, that was a good timing because that was right away when John Grisham started, got huge in the 90s. We both published our first books the same year. He's done a little better, but that's okay. He's a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Were you like getting the ideas? Were like were they like from like kind of like line order, ripped from the headlines, or not really? Uh, and I'd be crazy to admit it, even if I did. <laughs> uh, you know what people always say are, are was, you know, is this book based on one of your cases? And the answer really is no. I don't. I had some interesting cases, but none that I ever thought were material for a novel. Uh, but but sometimes people will see things that aren't there, just as you publish your first book and everybody who knows you or has ever known you either thinks they're in it or thinks they know who is in it, uh, who the characters are really based on. And uh, that's rarely true, but uh, probably the, the the closest coincidental similarity is a book that I wrote called Naked Justice, which was written before that came out in the aftermath of the O.J. Simpson trial, which, of course, was huge, uh, probably to this date the best known uh, murder case. And so people start and that also had a well-known i think he was a former athlete i know he was african-american he was a mayor not a movie star football player but there was just enough that i heard people saying oh this was based on the simpson case when really that was the furthest thing from my mind do you find like the television pop culture like any of these things do they influence the writing or or, or your novels you try to stay away from that Kind of like O.J. Like Simpson. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think it's more the other way around. I think it's television that's trying to uh, imitate books. And this trend you're seeing now toward, uh, instead of television series being made up of self-contained 42-minute episodes, and it doesn't really matter which order you watch them in because everything's rebooted at the start of the next one but instead the more successful television shows i think are going more towards long continuing story arcs trying to give their viewers the same immersive feeling of a really good book you know where you sink into the fictional world and you just want to stay there you don't want it to end oh yeah that's yeah that's uh like yeah and the whole they're trying to go for the whole binge now they want you to watch 20 episodes and all at one shot, kind of like reading a book. Well, there is that too. And I, you know, I always remind people that you could binge for just as long with the book and probably get more out of it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's probably, that's an interesting point that you brought up because I've noticed like uh, the, the big shows like that True Detective and HBO and the Fargo series, those were written by novelists. Uh, and uh, exactly so right. like they're translating it over to TV. I hadn't thought about that before. Uh, I don't know if you've read the book City of Thieves, but it's a terrific uh, first novel. 
And after I read it, I thought, man, this guy's terrific. Why hasn't he written more books and looked up his bio? Well, the reason he hasn't written more books is because he's showrunning for Game of Thrones, which uh, <laughs> that is a pretty good sh- a pretty good job. Yeah, yeah, a little busy. Probably, yeah, he's probably a little busy with that. Probably makes a little more money. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so... Um, You've also a, a, a published uh, like historical fiction I was seeing that you did something on the Elliot Ness. Uh, can you tell yes. us a little bit about that and the difference between that and like a thriller? That book was called Nemesis, and it's actually been optioned a couple times. They tell me there's still a miniseries in pre-production, but I've had so many things optioned at this point that I kind of just, you know, tell me when it's going to be on television, <laughs> and I'll believe it, but... Uh, it's based on a true incident. Of course, everybody, or at least everybody of a certain age, knows who Elliot Ness was, either from the two television series or uh, the two novels. Uh, I mean, novels, I meant movies, mo- most popularly the Kevin Costner one, which was a terrific film with, that had almost nothing to do with any reality, but still it was a terrific <laughs> film. What people don't know is what happened to Elliot Ness after the business with Al Capone. Because, of course, a few years later, Prohibition was repealed, and all those treasury agents uh, didn't have anything to do anymore. And uh, Ness floated for a while. Uh, He was a revenue agent for a while, chasing uh, people out in the backwoods of uh, rural America, but by 1935, he ended up in Cleveland, which by that time in history had a poor reputation. Uh, You know, a lot of the mob had moved there. They had labor racketeering. They had the highest juvenile crime rate in the world. They needed a safety director. So they hired uh, Elliot Ness, who did a terrific job for them as far as addressing conventional crime problems went. And uh, plus, he was a golden boy. The press loved him. He was one of the few people in law enforcement at that time who had been college educated. So he gave good interviews. He, he's good he's good looking. He actually looks a lot like Robert Stack, the guy who played him on the old television show. Um, and then the worm turns. And then this horrible series of gruesome murders began by this unknown person the press called the Cleveland Torso Murderer. And nobody knew what to do with about all these senseless, violent murders, uh, which, of course, with modern perspective, we see at, as the work of a serial killer, we understand. But uh, that term had not even been coined yet. Nobody had ever seen anything like this in America so eventually they bring in Elliot Ness, who, who uses all the conventional crime detective uh, mode, uh, crime detection methods, like let's, what do all the victims have in common? Well, nothing. He's a serial killer. <laughs> What's the motivation? Nothing. And uh, uh, ultimately, Elliot Ness was at least officially never able to catch the, uh, the killer who racked up more than a dozen murders. And man, when he couldn't bring home the Cleveland torso murder, the press turned on him big time. And uh, it led, it it was very dispiriting for him and and led to a lot of personal problems and probably contributed to his early death. And I felt that Ness had never really gotten a fair shake, which is what drew me to this. Plus, I thought, done all these movies about the Al Capone story. Why hasn't anybody ever done this? It's a great story. And I thought perhaps the reason was because it didn't have an ending. They never caught the bad guy. So I spent about two years, not continuously, but off and on traveling to Cleveland and doing research and came up with, I think, is the solution to the mystery. And that's what I presented the book. The key for me was that late in life, uh, when Ness was older and unemployed and spending the afternoons down at the sports bar telling his stories. He used to say, well, we knew who the guy was, but he was well connected and we couldn't arrest him. And of course, at the time, everyone thought, yeah, sure. (laughs) But I thought, what if that's actually true? 
And that was the angle that got me into the case. So that's what Nemesis is all about. Well, that's fascinating. I didn't realize that Elliot Ness had sort of a fallen from grace type of a towards the end there. Yeah, yeah, it was it was pretty sad. He uh, unfortunately started drinking and went through a series of divorces. Was eventually involved in a hit and run accident, and of course, the press was all, "Oh, how ironic that the prohibition agency uh, agent <laughs> now in a you know it was just awful, sad." Yeah. He did get the ending that he deserved, which, like I said, is another reason I wanted to write the book. Oh, yeah, sounds uh, fascinating. So, so that one is a, uh, so it's historical, but is it a fiction or? I tried to stay very close to the historical record. Now, the last 10% or so, where I basically dramatize what I think happened. That's my speculation based on a lot of really interesting evidence. But uh, the majority of it is very close to the historical record. Of course, I would invent dialogue and whatnot because it's a novel, but it's pretty much as it happened. And how much research do you do in, the, in your books? Like you said, you went to Cleveland Heat and uh, for this uh, book. Do you do a lot of research for, for all your books? I do. I find there's always something interesting to research. But I like that aspect of it. I, I like doing the research, and, and I like to have some real world in my books if you know what i mean mm. even in those ben kincaid novels which i don't want to make too much of it because they're entertainment and they're thrillers and they're meant to be engaging and exciting but there's always some non-fiction some factual information that may not be commonly known that comes out in the course of the book. And I think some readers like that. I, I think they like the feeling that they're kind of learning something at the same time that they're being entertained by the book. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, especially with the, like legal thrillers or medical thrillers, they expect, the, they expect certain to learn something from those. Right. Well, I guess they do. I don't, we were talking about television a minute ago. Uh, I think you will not find many actual lawyers who watch television legal dramas because it's all just so ludicrous yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just can't even you can't suspend disbelief long enough to get through some courtroom thing where the lawyer is smarting off to the judge or bickering <laughs> back and forth stuff that would never be permitted in any courtroom in the country uh you know it's just hard to get through so you, you don't get those uh those confessions on the stand like uh like uh, perry mason yeah. or <laughs> or which has happened never in real life <laughs> nobody's that good on cross x <laughs> helps if your clients are always innocent of course uh, but no i have never seen nor even heard about a confession on the witness stand outside of fiction now it was also very fascinating i was uh when i was looking in your background um your your novel the game master and that it was selected by Kindle Press, which was basically Amazon, and that whole Kindle Scout. I know a little bit about the Kindle Scout program, but not much. Can you tell us about that and, and how that went and what it felt like to get selected? Well, I, I liked it very much because, you know, I <laughs> uh, the power of Amazon and the book buying world today is obvious. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I've had... I don't know how many now, 25, 30 books from traditional New York publishers. But today, Amazon is selling more than 50% of all books sold in the United States. And about 70, depending on who you read, 72, 75% of all ebooks. And at least in the realm of adult genre fiction, ebooks outsell paper books so having <laughs> your publisher obvious also be the entity that is selling more books than anybody else uh, around that has some obvious advantages i mean which books are they going to promote more heavily obviously yeah. <laughs> the ones in which they have a vested interest if you've looked at some of the statistics that have come out from authors' earnings, uh, they go back and forth on whether ebook sales are up or down, or whether New York is making money or losing money 
But the one thing that is absolutely apparent to me is that Amazon's publishing division is doing extremely well. They publish a smaller percentage, but they sell way outsides of that, which, of course, just makes sense. Which books are they going to promote? Which books are they going to put in their readers who liked this would also like that and and so forth so i thought that made a lot of sense you've got to you know back when i started in 1991 it would have been different because then we had bookstores all over the place but now we've got one national bookstore chain and independent bookstores are increasingly rare and so you got to change with the times if you want to survive and so this kindle scout program was that sort of like uh uh, you, you submit your your manuscript, and then uh, people like vote on it. Is that the, how that works? Or yes, uh, it's like crowdsourcing for books, with the proviso that Amazon never pu- uh, promises. You know, we're going to pick the books that get the most votes. Mm. How they actually that might be a factor, but how they actually choose uh, is mysterious and not entirely known. I mean, if I were them, I would be picking the books I think you're going to do the most likely to do well, wouldn't you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Regardless of whether somebody's engineered a bot to vote for his book 6,000 times or something like that. Yeah, that would definitely be the danger if they went straight by votes because some sh- you know, shoddy operator would figure out how to game that. <laughs> yeah. Well, people are gaming Amazon's reviews all the time. So. Yeah, mm-hmm. But- so, and so what was the Game Master about? And I, I saw the, in the description that you got, uh, you mentioned you had the idea from uh, Dave Morell, who's one of my favorite uh, thriller writers. I was excited to see that. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, I love that book. And I love David, who's a terrific writer, of course, the author of First Blood, which gave us Rambo and is, you know, all movies aside, it's just a terrific book. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was at dinner with he and his wife one evening and somehow she and I got into talking about games and Scrabble. I think she's a Scrabble fan in particular. And I started rattling off all the, all the words that start with Q that aren't followed by you. And David's just looking at me like you're really into this, aren't you? You should use this in a book because his theory, which I think is correct, is that you should write about your passions, the things you love. And then if the book does well, great. If it doesn't do well, well, you haven't wasted your time because you've worked on a project that matters to you. And I think that's a pretty good way to approach it because books are so time consuming to write, as you know, and you can never predict how well a book is going to do. So you might as well be writing about something you enjoy. It took me a while to come up with a way to uh, get games and particularly board games into a thriller, but I did eventually come up with it. And <laughs> that's the Game Master, which was a lot of fun to write. I think it's my longest, most uh, involved books. I even had, I, I hired a designer to create illustrations for the book based on my hand-drawn illustrations so that readers could follow the games, you know, Mm -hmm. like see the poker hands or the Scrabble tiles, uh, or uh, there are even some older, more historical um, board games that become important. That's a great idea with with illustrations, Um, sort of like... seeing the images as you're reading the uh, the action right well you can rearrange the scrabble tiles in, in your <laughs> mind or play along there's some uh, uh the a hero the game master mm-hmm. uh, is uh, who's the world champion chess player poker pa- player north american scrabble champ so he's dubbed the game master and someone has deliberately involved him in a horrible crime and left clues which, of course, as it turns out, he is perfectly equipped to solve, and that's what draws him into a much larger and uh, more horrible plot. But peppered along the way are all these puzzles and games. And uh, when you when you start writing your uh, uh, your books, do you um, do you have like a detailed outline, and do you do a lot of plotting? Or? 
I do usually outline. I'm not sure I would use the word detailed, but I kind of map it out and make sure that it all makes sense and that I have some idea where I'm going. And I think that's smart. Uh, you hear people, uh, writers in particular, never want to admit that they they outline because I think that they believe that that will make them sound too uh, methodical or something and critics won't like them anymore but the reality is most do but the reality is also when you actually sit down to write the book everything may change because writing a book is very different from an outline from doing an outline doesn't mean it was a bad idea to create the outline it just means it's going to change and get better as you go along and uh, uh, the main thing the outline does is that when I sit down on my chair every day to start to write, I never look at the screen and think, now, what's going on? What What is this? Where am I heading with this? <laughs> <laughs> I can look at the outline and remind myself in big picture what's going on here. And you use, uh, when you start writing, do you use um, uh, Word? Is that the what you're using to write your, 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 your novels? It's what I use now, I think, uh, you know. It seems to be the industry norm now, mm -hmm. so I don't, the point is of doing something else. Yeah. And then uh, also I was noticing you uh, have a lot of books on, um, uh, I guess it would be nonfiction, on, on writing fiction. And yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, so, so these are, I've been seeing some of the titles, uh, these look like really great books, like on, on plots and, and dialogue. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that part of, of your writing? Well, I started that a few years ago. Uh, I've taught, usually during the summer, I've taught fiction writing seminars, uh, usually five-day seminars, very intensive five days, though. Don't come unless you're ready to work. <laughs> and and I should say, if you're interested, go to my website, which is just williambernhardt.com, and you'll find information. Uh, but I realize that not everybody can come to a seminar, and so I started thinking about putting some of the essentials in, in, in some of these books. So I started with the core three, story structure, creating character, perfecting plot, and wrote them. And I tried to keep it, you know, to the point, not a lot of messing around, not 6,000 examples of everything or excerpts or stuff that I think sometimes people put in just to pad books. I just... You know, pretty short and to the point said, here's what you need to know, and kept all the books of reasonable length, about 100, 120 pages, I think, which keeps the price low and also means you're not going to waste a lot of time. You can read it in the afternoon and then get back to your writing, which <laughs> is what you should be do, it, doing. It shouldn't be an excuse for not writing. Read it and get back to work. And uh, those took off not only as books, but as audiobooks. So I recorded the audiobooks myself, uh, never really expecting anything much from it, but uh, my wife, Laura, is an audiobook narrator, so she knew how to do it. So I recorded them, and it turns out they do tremendously well. Digitalization has made it so easy for people to just download audiobooks directly to their phone or iPod. And, and that's really taken off. So since the first three, I've done four more of the books on writing. There was Promising Premise, and then Dynamic Dialogue, Sizzling Style, and Excellent Editing, and probably another one later this year after I finish this novel that I'm working on and, and get to that. Uh, but uh, I, as I said before, when I originally wrote them, I thought, well, this this is something that, that the people who can't come to my summer writing retreats can read instead. But, but what I have found is that people are still come to the retreats. They sell out every year, but, uh, but they've all read these books in advance. And so we can, you know, push the retreat up to a higher level and move further, which is really kind of terrific. Yeah, and how long do your retreats last? Are they like a, a weekend or has? Usually, no, usually five days. Mm. Bought a weekend and, and and take three days off for work and come down and it's very, very fun but also very intensive. Most people can tell they're writing 
at a higher, more professional level when they when they leave than they were doing when they got there, which which is good. And something like more than two dozen of my students have gone on to publish. So, oh I wow, think it's, yeah, that's that has to be rewarding. It is, and it, you know, I call those the red sneaker series of books. The suggestion being that. This is more down to earth, practical, useful, not so artsy. Go with your feelings, but more practical. This is how to write a good book. And since then, I've also started a Red Sneaker e newsletter, which is completely free. If you're interested, just go to my website and sign up for it. And there's even now a Red Sneaker phone app, which you can download to your phone. Again, completely free just look for red sneaker writers and that gives you my weekly blog and any information about retreats or conferences or where i'm going to be appearing stuff like that yeah i just uh, signed up for your uh, for your newsletter because uh, the i was reading some of your blog posts i, re- I suggest people go to your website too because they have the blog uh, your tips that you're offering in your blog and stuff are also been uh, are, are pretty amazing Thank you. Yeah. And then I was going to, I want to ask you about the, uh, I, I saw you have a course on the Writer's Digest University. Uh, yes. That's going to run from May to June. Can you tell us about that? And is that, uh, that going to be, I'm assuming that's all online? Yes, it's all online. Uh, again, you know, if you can't come to something in person, go sign up for that. It goes on for six weeks, I believe. Uh, and, you know, the people submit assignments every week, and I read them and give them feedback. But there's also a discussion board, so we can all kind of talk back and forth, and usually it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and that's, that's uh, writing the thriller novel, so it's obviously it's, uh, uh, tailored for, uh, asp- well, not only aspiring, but just writers who want to write thrillers. Well, that's the title, but, you know, I've done it before, and I see all kinds of people saying <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So. I, I think you can write whatever you want. Most of the lessons are geared toward, in some way, uh, generating suspense or mm-hmm. conflict. But, you know, all books should have suspense, and all books should have tension and conflict. That's what stories are all about. Yep, that's what makes them fun to read, that's for sure. <laughs> so before I, th- I let you go, is there uh, any other uh, any, anything else you'd like to say or any advice that you'd like to offer, for, especially those uh, who are listening who are aspiring writers? Well, as far as what I'd like to say, I think I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, that my most recent novel, also a historical novel, is Challengers of the Dust, which is set during the Oklahoma Dust Bowl, but a lot of fun, and I had a lot of fun researching and writing it. And the best advice I can give for aspiring writers, even though this sounds kind of trite and not helpful, but it's really the key to the whole thing, is don't quit. Don't give up. Don't get frustrated. Don't feel like, oh, this is so hard, I can't do that. I can't do this. Everybody feels that way. Even guys who've written 40 books get frustrated because writing is simply hard. Just understand that you're not going to get that book written overnight, and you're probably not going to be published overnight either. But the people who succeed are the people who don't give up. So keep writing learn everything you can uh, about writing and don't give up uh, William thank you so much for uh, being on the podcast I really appreciate uh, your time and talking to us about uh, writing and your books my pleasure thanks for having me thank you for listening to this episode of Meet the Thriller Author I'd like to ask you to please review and rate this uh, podcast over on iTunes it really helps me get the word out if you take a few seconds of your time to uh, do that it would be much appreciated you can also visit my website at thrillingreads.com forward slash podcast for show notes on this episode as well as information about the uh, podcast in general and you can also sign up for my mailing list there you'll be getting uh, special offers from our guests as well as information uh, behind the scenes information on the podcast and uh, please do visit my author website at alanpeterson.com i appreciate your support and so until next episode i will talk to you then